notícia cavalo coração. Eu quero ver você mandar a razão. Pra mim não é qualquer notícia cavalo coração. Eu quero ver você mandar a razão. Pra mim não é qualquer notícia cavalo coração. Eu quero ver você mandar a razão. Pra mim não é qualquer notícia cavalo coração. Se toda hora é hora de ir pra decisão, eu falo agora. Eu jogo o mundo fato consumado, vou embora. Não quero mais ou mais me enganar nessa história. Arrei os meus anseios, perco o veio e vivo de memórias. Eu quero é viver em paz, por favor, me beija a boca. Que louca, que louca. Eu quero é viver em paz, por favor, me beija a louca. Que louca, que louca. São Batons, assinando a trilha sonora do nosso programa a semana inteira. Elas juram que só estão tocando juntas há dois meses. Daqui a pouco a gente vai tirar essa história limpo, viu? Agora eu vou para a minha entrevista nacional. A entrevista nacional de hoje é com a Anne Zamba. Ela nasceu em Londres, é budista há mais de 40 anos, estudou com Dalai Lama, já meditou nas montanhas e cavernas do Himalaia por mais de uma década, trabalhou com Madre Teresa de Calcutá é, no Camboja, no Vietnã. Ela veio a Teresina para uma palestra sobre inteligência emocional e é claro que nós conversamos com ela. Veja que a entrevista é incrível. Entrevista com a Anilá, a gente vai conversar com ela. Bom, você é inglesa e em 1968 você foi para a Índia, é, para praticar meditação com alguns dos principais mestres da meditação do século XX, incluindo o Dalai Lama, que deve ter sido um privilégio, eu imagino. Eu queria que você contasse um pouco para a gente dessa época. So, uh, before I came to Buddhism, I went through many different spiritual traditions. Not, I didn't come directly to Buddhism. I was trying to make sense of my own confusion. I was very confused at that time. I'd been in hospital, I'd been totally paralyzed for many years. And I, I was just finding my body again. I was just learning how to walk. I was learning how to live again. Aos 13 anos, é, você esteve entre a vida e a morte. Você chegou ao budismo, segundo você mesmo nos diz, após ficar doente, e nesse encontro com o budismo, você prometeu que ajudaria outras pessoas caso ficasse curada. O que, que aconteceu em relação a essa doença? O que você tinha exatamente? Eu tinha uma doença chamada polineuritis, que atacou o sistema nervoso. É um vírus que atacou o sistema nervoso. E então, te deixa completamente paralisado. Você não pode mover um finger, você não pode comer, você não pode digestar. Você tem tubos que vão em e tubos que vão em. Yeah, so you're you're dead. You're physically dead. Yeah, you can put a cigarette on your hand. You don't feel anything. But inside, the pain is incredible. Yeah. So it took me uh, three three years before I could begin to move again. So then, when I recovered, I didn't know anything about Buddhism at that time. But when I was very ill, I wanted to commit suicide. There was no reason for me to continue. But a friend of mine came to see me and she said, you know, think of something positive to do with your life. And I said, positive, you're joking. You know, what can I do? I can't do anything. Yes, I can't do anything. So she said, think of something positive. You never know what can happen. So then I, I said to myself, not believing, I said, if I recover from this disease, I'll give my life to helping other beings. So then when I began to recover, I had to keep that promise that I made. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't even help myself. How could I help anybody else? So then the search began to find something in my life that made sense of the confusion. Yeah. So then I, I went overland from England. I went to live in the Middle East, and then from the Middle East, I then went overland through Turkey, through Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, until I got to India. Quanto tempo você ficou doente? Three years. Three years, completely paralyzed. Yes. If I wanted to turn over in the bed, I had to wait for somebody to turn me from one side to the other. 
quando você ficou boa, você tinha quantos anos? I was, uh, when I got sick, I was 13 and a half, and when I got better, I was 16 and a half. Como é, é tornar-se budista? It means you change the way you see life, because Buddhism is about our perception. It's about how the mind works. Yes. Yeah, so then you don't look outside for the answers to happiness and well-being. You look inside at your own mental processes, the source of your own experience the source of experience how your experience is created by your own mental processes foi o budismo que curou você no because i didn't i didn't know buddhism when i was ill i didn't know anything about buddhism when i lived in england buddhism cured my confusion or is curing my confusion and the confusion is really why we have all the ups and downs in our life because we don't understand we don't recognize our own essential nature o século 21 fez as pessoas ficarem mais confusas nós temos é, muito muita distração muitos desafios a internet, os estímulos, está hum. tudo muito propício à confusão. Uhum. Então, o século XXI é um século de confusão, ou da confusão. Eu queria que ela falasse sobre isso. Eu não posso dizer que é mais confusão, mas é, você sabe, definitivamente muito densa essa confusão. Porque nós não sabemos onde encontrar as respostas. Nós estamos correndo atrás de coisas que nunca podem trazer as respostas para o que estamos procurando. Yes, you just, you know, you, you run after anything that looks good, believing that that's the cause of happiness. And then you end up with more and more dissatisfaction, more and more stress, more and more, yeah, more and more suffering. Yeah, because you see, whatever you run after, it's never enough. There's always something else, something else, something. Yeah, so then the feeling is there's always something missing in your life. Como preencher isso? Yeah, you have to first of all find out where you can find the answer to what you're looking for, which is this state of contentment and well-being. Yeah, if you if you run after something that is changing in your life, if you run run after anything that is changing, then that good feeling will only last as long as the conditions last. Yeah, so you have to find something that's not changing. Well, you have to understand. First of all, you have to understand that everything that you're running after now is changing. All right, so then, you, so then you know you can't depend on those things. You can play with those things, but you can't depend on them because they can never bring you that genuine happiness that you're looking for. You know, when I say genuine, I mean happiness that doesn't change when the conditions change. It's a, it's a state of well-being that doesn't depend on conditions. So then you have to look. You have to look at all these things that you depend on now. And then slowly you begin to see there's only, you know, the only thing that doesn't change is your own essential nature. A meditação é, ensinou muito a você. Como foi a sua experiência de meditação nas cavernas do Himalaia? Você passou mais de uma década meditando por lá. Como você conseguiu? It's, you know, it's a process. It's a process of understanding how your own mind works. It's, you're constantly looking at different aspects of your own psychology. You're looking at your own emotional makeup, you're looking at your thought process, you're looking at everything that is your own experience of life. You're looking very deeply into how you experience and why you experience things in certain ways. And that you look at your feelings, yes, all the components of your own psychology. And you understand that by changing the way you think, you change the way you see. You look more and more deeply, you investigate very much, very deeply into your own experience, why you see things in certain ways. Meditation, if we, if we look at the word meditation, it means familiarize. So then you have to ask yourself, well, what are you familiarizing yourself with? You're familiarizing your yourself with an, another way of seeing. You're changing the way you see. It's about perception. Por que 10 anos? Foram anos necessários ou porque foi difícil para você? Yes. It's, you know, 10 years is really nothing. 
You don't, you don't have to be in a cave to meditate. Yeah, but I wanted to be isolated so that I could really, you know, introspect within myself. And I, I wasn't disturbed by outer stimulus. I was really left alone. Tem um ditado conhecido que diz, vamos manter a mente quieta, o coração tranquilo e a espinha ereta. O que é mais difícil dessas fases? No, everything supports, you know, everything is a support. The straight spine helps to support the way the, the subtle energies flow in the body. And the subtle energies are like the, the horse. The consciousness is like the rider of the horse. So when the energies flow more freely and more relaxed, then the mind can calm down. So the straight body is important. Yeah. Seu caminho sempre foi cheio de projetos sociais em diversos países. É, você trabalhou com recuperação de viciados em drogas na Tailândia. É, eu queria saber o que, que você pensa sobre o uso de drogas dentro dessa sua experiência de projetos sociais. O que, que você aprendeu nesse projeto e nessa passagem importante da sua vida? Yes, you know, there's different, different reasons why people use drugs. It's, you know, virtually everyone's looking for a way to feel better than what they do. You know, whether we call it happiness or satisfaction, security, you can call it many different things, but everyone's looking for a way to feel better in some way or to escape from the suffering. For example, in the, the place that I worked in Thailand, it was actually a Buddhist monastery, and people came from all over the world to be cured of all kinds of drug dependence. It was all, the cure was done with herbal medicine, not with, with chemicals. Yeah, what was so different about this particular place was there was almost, I think, 250 monks there, and 80% of them were all ex-heroin addicts. So then, through this process of going through the herbal medicine and training, living there and learning skills, then they decided they wanted to commit their life to helping other people. So they have wonderful projects. It's all kinds of, you know, music and arts and different kinds of training programs for communities. It's the most successful project in the world as far as curing people from drug addiction learning all kinds of skills but also focused on the psychology of the person. Yet yeah, 20% is physical, 80% is psychological. Você também trabalhou no lar para destituídos e moribundos Madre Teresa de Calcutá, na Índia. Como foi isso trabalhar com Madre Teresa de Calcutá? Very inspirational. It was one of the most difficult and challenging times of my life, I think. Yeah, this was be before I became a Buddhist. No. I was still very much a hippie, yeah, and I, I was searching for something. I'd been through Hinduism and Jainism and many different spiritual traditions. I was given some land to make a, a hospital for sannyasis. Where? in India, but I had no skills, no ability. So then one day I saw a picture of Mother Teresa in a newspaper, and I thought, oh, she'll know what, how to do this. I, I, maybe if I go to her, she'll help me. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went from Madras to Kolkata, yes, and then I asked her, uh, I said, please, can I work with you? And she said, we have no place for you. And I said, please, please let me stay. And she said, we don't have any place for you. She said, do you care where you, where you live? No, I don't care. You can put me anywhere. I didn't know what I said. She put me living in the home with the destitute and dying people. That's where I lived and worked 24 hours a day. All day just taking care of them, and all night I would take the bodies down and burn them by the river. So that was my work for one year, just taking care of people who were very close to death. And some people recovered, and, and many people didn't. She's so inspiring. She's tiny, so strong, so powerful, so much courage, and so much devotion. I always tell the story. She, she used to come there on a, a Sunday, that, because she had so many different projects. And Sunday, she would come to the home for the destiny. And everybody would wait for her to visit on a Sunday. And she said to me one Sunday, she said, you know, this is my favorite place. 
And this is like the worst, anybody else would think this was the worst place on the planet. And so then I, I said to her, why is this your favorite place? And she said, because you can see Christ everywhere. And then she said to me, people don't understand that heaven is right here on earth. Você guardou o jornal? <laughs> I just kept, kept her in my heart. Yeah. Mas você estava certa, né? Quando viu o jornal e disse que ela podia ensinar algo a você. She was the one who told me to work with drug, drug addicts. Yes, that was 1969. Você também, é, Monja, trabalhou com os, nos campos de refugiados no Camboja. Foi outra zona de conflito que você vivenciou e que você aprendeu outras lições. Nos fale sobre isso. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Killing Fields about the Khmer Rouge when they killed for one and a half million people in Cambodia. So it, this was the most, I gave up on human beings. Yes, I could never believe that one human being could do this to another. With Mother Teresa, I saw suffering, but I never saw suffering like I did in, in Cambodia and these refugee camps, it's incredible. The children were given guns to kill their parents. You, do, you know, people would, they would come up to you and they would say, show your hands. And if your hands weren't workers' hands, you were shot. If you were educated, you were shot. If you were a doctor, you were shot. All the educated people in Cambodia were killed. All the children were taken away from their parents from the age of five. Yeah, it was just, you can't even imagine the, the situation. It was so bad. What do you say about the situation of the from Syria, from Iraq, and from other zones of war today? What are we watching? What is happening with the world, with the human being, to watch this type of barbarity? It's not so much. We have to look at the, the cause of what is going on causing this. What we see now is the result, the refugees. So if we look at the cause of all the conflicts in the Middle East, we could say that it's government's policies. And that comes from confusion, not seeing clearly the greed, the aggression, the, the, the wish to power, control. It comes out of confusion, believing that the answer to happiness is power and money, control, that's what the, the idea is of people, that if they have control, then that's the answer to happiness. Yeah, so then we have all these different policies, which, you know, I, I was telling my students the other day in America, I was in America yesterday, yeah, and I said, you know, out of, I think it was 239 years, I may be wrong, of independence, American independence. 220 years they've been at war. Isn't that so? What does that tell you? Does that tell you that it's the answer? Qual é o sistema político que você mais simpatiza? I think, you know, the, the value system, we have to change our value system. At the moment, Bhutan has a great value system because what is it? The GNP is a, the happiness, isn't it? It's not about money, it's about, you know, how happy the people are. O Brasil está criando o um índice de felicidade, mas depende dos políticos entenderem e votarem. That's right, you know what? Everybody has different ideas as to what is going to bring happiness. You know, what is happiness? That's the question that we all need to ask ourselves. What is it, this idea of happiness that we're running after? You know, the only way that we know happiness is by comparing it to unhappiness. Because now, when we're happy, we don't appreciate being happy. We're always looking for something else. Always looking for something else. So we never appreciate what we have. So when I ask people, you know, what do you really want from this life? Most people, they can't answer. So then I ask the next question. What don't you want from this? That's easier to answer than to answer, you know, what it is that you're looking for. So basically, nobody wants to suffer. And yet we constantly create more and more conditions for suffering. So what's wrong? 
well, maybe we're looking in the wrong place. You know, we're not really investigating what is the cause of suffering. Not the symptoms, but the cause of suffering. Yeah, so then we have to come back to the, our own mental processes to understand both the cause of happiness and the cause of unhappiness. Você tem medos, monja? I don't think I'm particularly afraid of anything. I often ask myself, all right, if I'm, am I ready to die right now, this moment? Am I ready to let go of everything I know? Yeah. That's, that's the question, to see if you're afraid or not. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because we hold on to different things. Yeah. yeah. But I, I really trust my own nature. Você hoje está integrada ao mundo virtual? O que, é que você pensa da internet? Você tem um WhatsApp? No, I don't have a telephone because I don't have a signal where I live. I don't have energy where I live. All right. So then, when I come to the town, then I have an, then I have internet, and then I have Facebook, so-called 4,200 friends. <laughs> And through Facebook, I write to them, we communicate, I give teachings, I introduce them to different ideas. O que você faz para se divertir? I don't do anything because I'm already happy. I don't need anything. There's nothing missing. That's the difference. There's nothing missing. I'm not looking for something. Você está no Brasil há 10 anos na Bahia num projeto super bonito, importante. É, eu queria que você falasse sobre esse projeto e na sequência falar sobre o ciclo de palestras que tem a ver com o seu livro, que é a Dança das Emoções. 15 years, I think. Basically, uh, my aspiration for Brazil was to do a project for human development. Because we talk about human development a lot, but we haven't really, again, we haven't really investigated what do we really need for human development. Yes. So then the project that I was initiating was environmental education, preservation, research, kind of release themselves from the conditions that result in suffering in their life. So then that is the opportunity to find genuine happiness. Você vem muitas vezes a Teresina. Você gosta daqui, eu imagino, né? O que que Teresina lhe diz? O que que você sente na nossa cidade? Yes, I like I like the people, you know, over the years I've really cultivated some very uh, strong relationships with people. I don't do too well in the heat, but I don't think the people of Teresina do too well in the heat either. De qualquer forma, mesmo sem se dar muito bem, ela vem tantas vezes é uma prova de amor. I hope it. I hope it is. Hope Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Muito bom, né? Ouvir quem tem esse tipo de percepção do mundo e de experiência, falar sobre inteligência emocional. Como a gente aprende, na verdade, com a trajetória de pessoas especiais como Anne Zamba. Bom, antes de ir para o intervalo comercial, é, eu queria mostrar as dicas de livros da Anchieta. Vamos começar com a Amazônia Indígena, só lembrando que a Anchieta tem dois endereços, na Álvaro Mendes, no centro de Teresina e na Nossa Senhora de Fátima, na Zona Leste. E em São Luís, a Anchieta é livraria moderna, é uma livraria que está no bairro Monte Castelo, é, lá em São Luís. A Amazônia Indígena, Márcio Souza, é fantástico, né? A Amazônia, na verdade, é uma das pátrias... É, do mito, onde ainda existe uma unidade entre o pensamento e uma vida constante, cheia de estímulos. É maravilhoso, gente, esse livro. É maravilhoso, maravilhoso, sensacional. Se eu fosse você, não deixava de ver. E a outra é do André Lara Rezende, Devagar e Simples, Economia, Estado e Vida Contemporânea, da Companhia das Letras. Né? Se você pensa, na verdade, que os economistas abriram mão é, da reflexão e da área em nome de um tecnicismo estéreo, você tem que estar tá preparado para mudar de opinião, porque esse livro traz uma outra percepção em relação a isso. Aliás, a economia é uma das áreas é, da ciência que mais tem se mostrado desafiadora e entendendo mais o que a gente está acontecendo que está acontecendo no mundo. Tanto que na área da economia hoje, a gente tem ciências como a economia da atenção. Né? E aí outro dia a gente fala sobre isso, quem sabe numa entrevista, para a gente ganhar tempo. Deixa eu chamar o um recado do Werner, são profissionais super qualificados, maravilhosos, no segundo piso do Teresina Shopping. Veja o recado. 
Vernecoi está no mercado de beleza há 25 anos e seu principal conceito é proporcionar beleza e bem-estar às pessoas. Atendimento personalizado com espaço exclusivo e padronizado e um ambiente moderno e sofisticado. Temos uma equipe de profissionais altamente capacitados que estão sempre em constantes especializações. Serviços e produtos exclusivos para cada tipo de necessidade dos nossos clientes. Werner Koifer, loja 370, segundo andar, Teresina Shopping. Vamos agora com o seu batom e no próximo bloco vamos saber tudo dessas meninas que assinam a trilha sonora do nosso programa hoje, tá bom? Até já! Não, ele não vai mais dobrar, pode até se acostumar, ele vai viver sozinho, desaprendeu a dividir, foi escolher o mal. de pagar 